We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. And no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me and the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it today! I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good morning, it's 9.30 and this is The Briefing with me, Emily Carver. I'm standing in for the wonderful Tom Harwood this morning on your TV and radio. I'll be bringing you all the latest from Westminster, Westminster. but first your morning news with Rosie Wright. A very good morning, it's half past nine, I'm Rosie Wright, let's get you up to date. The Transport Secretary Mark Harper says the RMT's decision to reject an improved pay offer is incredibly disappointing and unfair to the public. A pay rise of 8% and a guarantee of no compulsory redundancies before April 2024 had been tabled. But the UK's biggest rail union said the deal wouldn't protect its members and would lead to unsafe practices. The strike action is due to go ahead for four days this month. Meanwhile, 33,000 members of the Fire Brigades Union will vote today if they should walk out following a 5% pay offer. The FBU says striking is the last resort, but that many are desperate and some are struggling to afford to live. The UK's business, biggest business group says there'll be a decade of lost economic growth if Britain isn't ready to take action.
The CBI forecasts the country's already in recession with rocketing inflation, negative growth and failing productivity. The group say stagflation, a combination of stagnation and rising prices, is preventing firms from investing. If the Labour Party win the next general election, they'll look at abolishing the House of Lords. Speaking at a conference in Leeds today, Sir Keir Starmer is going to promise the biggest ever transfer of power from Westminster to the British people if they're elected. Well, we'll get the details shortly. We'll bring that speech to you live just after 10am. And England are through to the World Cup quarterfinals. They're going to face off against defending champions France on Saturday. Last night, the Three Lions comfortably beat Senegal 3-0 in Qatar. Jordan Henderson, Captain Harry Kane and Bukayo Saka all scored. However, England forward Raheem Sterling wasn't present at the game. The 27-year-old has flown back to the UK after armed intruders broke into his home while his family were inside. Manager Gareth Southgate says family is the most important thing and didn't say whether the Chelsea winger would return to the squad for Saturday's game. We're on your TV online and DAB Plus Radio. It's GB News. Now let's go back to the briefing with Emily. Good morning. It's 9.30. This is The Briefing with me, Emily Carver, on your TV and radio. So, leading this morning's briefing, Sir Keir Starmer will today promise the biggest transfer of power from Westminster to the British people as he unveils a new report on Britain's future this morning, titled A New Britain. The report makes multiple recommendations, including handing more power to local authorities, moving civil servants out of London and reforming the House of Lords. With us this morning is our political editor, Darren McCaffrey. Good morning. Darren. Good morning. So we're expecting to hear from Keir Starmer just after 10, are we? It seems that this uh, report may be a continuation of the new Labour legacy. Yeah, indeed, we're going to hear from the Labour leader at just after 10 o'clock, so in about 30 minutes' time, Emily. You're right, interestingly, Labour are in some ways trying to portray this this morning as a continuation of some of the constitutional reforms that we saw under Tony Blair uh, that involved getting rid of most hereditary peers in the House of Lords, the Supreme Court, uh, for example. Keir Starmer's argument effectively is that there's too much power at Westminster. When you look at other comparable countries, power is much more devolved to the nations and the regions and that's what he is going to argue through this report written by Gordon Brown remember him of course another former uh, Labour Prime Minister he's been working on it for the last uh, two years what is involved uh, they would argue as I say more powers to local authorities to councils across the country to the different mayors up and down uh, and around and indeed to the Volves uh, government as well 50,000 civil servants being dispatched from London around 10% of the entire civil service but also uh, this uh, kind of eye-catching idea of essentially abolishing the House of Lords all uh, together. Now, there's been much criticism of the Lords, uh, indefensible Labour calls it this morning, but criticisms across the boards uh, from those that argue it's got too big, over 800 members, some saying it's linked to cronyism, i.e. Prime Ministers essentially giving jobs to their mates in the Lords for life, if you like. Uh, so Labour are saying that they would get rid of it, that it would be wholly elected. Now, there seemed to be this row over the weekend about whether Labour were properly committed to this because while these are proposals, Labour aren't going to commit to them, Emily, at this stage. They're going to put them out for consultation. Uh, but Keir Starmer's been on the TV this morning saying that, yes, he would try and do this in his first term, term as a Labour uh, Prime Minister. His overarching ideological tilt, if you like, is an argument in which he says that the Northern Powerhouse, things like levelling up are really good ideas, but they can't really be done if all the power and the control is down in London and he's also arguing that yes while he backed Remain that if Brexit's about taking back control it means taking back control not just as I say in Westminster but indeed in the different parts of the UK. Going to get full details and indeed questions to Sir Keir Starmer a little after 10 o'clock so in about 30 minutes time. Just uh, one question before you go Darren. Do you get the idea that there is public appetite for sweeping constitutional reform? Keir Starmer coming out today, as you said, to say that he wants to banish the House of Lords. Is that what the public want? Is that what Labour voters want? A really interesting question. I'm not entirely sure, sure constitutional reform is high on most people's political agendas at the best of times. 
almost certainly not during a cost of living crisis when people are worried about electricity costs and the cost of the weekly shop. So I'm not going to say that this is a an argument that's going to win Labour lots and lots of votes up and down the country. Almost certainly not. But at the same time, uh, you know, Labour would argue that they keep getting criticised for having no policies and not properly laying out what they want to do as a government and that this is, of course, part of what they're going to do. Is it radical? It is pretty radical. Uh, the question is, constitutional reform always seems quite radical. It's always something that political parties promise they're going to do. But when they get into government, uh, they tend to find that things are a little bit more tricky than when they thought. As I say, you only have to think back to Tony Blair, actually. He wanted to get rid of the hereditary peers altogether. There are still, well, I think it's around 80, 90 who still sit in the upper chamber. So these things are easily said, more difficult to do. Yes, very much so. Thank you very much. That was political editor Darren McCaffrey there this morning. Yes, I mean, it's easy for the, uh, for the Labour Party to talk about constitutional reform perhaps in the future, but they haven't committed to uh, telling us whether they'll spend more on public services. Perhaps that's a little more tricky. Now, moving on, strikes, strikes and more strikes. The Transport Secretary, Mark Harper, says the RMT's decision to reject an improved pay offer by 8% over two years is, in quotes, incredibly disappointing and unfair to the public. Today is the last chance for a deal to be reached to prevent a week of strike action in the lead-up to Christmas. Christmas. At the same time, the NHS faces more industrial unrest in the new year. The General Secretary of Unison, Christina McEnea, dismissed the government's initial offer of a 2% pay rise as, in quotes, ludicrous. Joining me now is commentator and broadcaster James Melville. James, so it's looking uh, particularly difficult for the gov right, government right now. The RMT has yet again uh, rejected a what seems to be a pretty reasonable pay offer. Um, well, I'm actually on the side um, of the unions here. I think basically the government have had months of warnings about this um, and they haven't done anything about it. And now we're heading into strikes. I mean, on so many different issues, the government have been asleep at the wheel. And we as taxpayers need to ask, what are our taxes being spent on? They should be spent on public service workers getting fair settlements, in particular when inflation is going through the roof, and also facilities and services generally. And we're not getting that. We also need to question about where the government is spending their money generally on things like HS2, you know, the failed PPE schemes in terms of billions of pounds there, tax havens in terms of tax avoidance. There's so much wastage in our tax money. And I think basically there is a point in terms of public sector workers because the money that they're currently getting in real terms and the offers from the government are still below inflation. But the government should have sorted this out months ago. And here we are, running up to Christmas, with numerous aspects of public sector workers who are potentially going to strike. And I see their point, because the offers that the government is still giving are below the rate of inflation. What the government should have done is sorted this out months ago. And there's a bigger debate about what exactly are we as taxpayers spending our money on? What is the social contract? And there needs to be almost like a review of government spending across the board, in particular fair settlements for public sector workers and also public sector services as well. I accept that, James, and I think a lot of people would like to see our public sector workers paid more, particularly with the cost of living so high. But something that I think does frustrate people is that the RMT and militant unions in many sectors aren't willing to make any reasonable compromises when it comes to working conditions. So, for example, when giving pay rises, they expect that there might be some changes to current working practices. That's what the Rail Delivery Group says, perhaps repurposing or closing some ticket offices introducing new skill, skilled roles that could be more flexible, etc, etc. In the private sector, businesses have to change with the times. It seems that the rail unions aren't willing to do the same. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. I mean, it should be in the round all of this. It's about what is effective spend of our tax money after all. And there's two things that are aligned together. It's first of all in terms of pay for workers, but also facilities. And therefore, the bit in the middle is management of all of that. So if you look at even if you talk about NHS, NHS in crisis, it's all different aspects to that. It's about staffing levels, it's about pay, it's about facilities as well. But that's a combination 
in terms of financial settlement from government, but also management within those public sectors as well. So I think the public have a lot of sympathy with public sector workers, understand the role they have in society. But there is a big question mark generally in a broader debate about financing, but also management structures within the sectors of those public sectors as well. And I think that's something that's a broader debate. I think the unions also are struggling to see what the Labour Party would be doing differently at this point. We had Bridget Phillipson, who's the edu Education Sec Shadow Secretary, doing the media rounds yesterday, saying that she, and she would not commit to raising public sector wages in line with inflation either. Is it the case that uh, both parties are squeezed simply because of the public finances? Yeah, I think there's a bit of that as well. But then you've got to ask the question about where's our money being spent on? I mean, I mentioned some examples about where I think it's wastage of public money. I mean, if you're looking at HS2 as a perfect example of that, I mean, also, for instance, the government are still giving tens of millions of foreign aid money to China. And considering what China are doing, is that best use of our taxpayers' money as well? For instance, MPs' pay rises, MPs' expenses. If you're looking at the, the lack of government action on tax havens and tax avoidance, there's a number of different things where if we took a step back, well, where is our money being spent? For me, I think our money should be spent on the ultimate aspects of the social contract, and that's effective public services. And as part of that is effective settlements for public sector workers. But as I said at the start, this should have been negotiated and sorted out months ago. But it wasn't sorted out months ago in the summer because the government's priorities were, well, their own priorities elsewhere, in particular an endless leadership contest. We've known about, for instance, the cost of living crisis, increased inflation, potential strikes for months, but the government were asleep at the wheel. They weren't doing anything about it because they were indulging in the worst game show ever, and that was two rounds of a leadership contest. And here we are in the winter, coming up to a winter of discontent in terms of escalating prices combined with potential strikes. And fundamentally, the fault of that is the government because they didn't take steps to sort this out months ago. Yes, I think I could certainly agree that lots of time and lots of money has been wasted by our government over the past few months. And always, I would argue. Thank you very much for joining us. That was James Melville, political commentator, um, giving us his take on the strike action and the upcoming strike action. Now we're going to move on to another thing that's returning to Parliament today. That's the online safety bill after a five-month delay. The Commons is holding the report stage. The government has said the planned reforms to online safety and regulation were prompted by the case of teenager Molly Russell, who committed suicide, sadly, in 2017 after viewing self-harm content online. Culture Secretary Michelle Donnellan has confirmed that a controversial clause deeming content legal but harmful would be scrapped, but Labour insists they would actually restore the clause. With me now to discuss this further is co-founder of Us For Them, Molly Kingsley. Molly, thank you very much for joining me. Now, a lot of us freedom-minded people are concerned that this bill may not have struck the balance correctly uh, when it comes to balancing safety for children and freedom of speech. Where do you stand? I think it's a really difficult one. And I think it's interesting because often child safety is pitted against freedom of speech. And that's been the case with this bill, hasn't it? I mean, you're generally thought to be either in the free speech camp and then you don't like the legal but harmful provisions or in the child safety camp, um, in which case you want stronger provisions. And I think coming at it as, as you know, obviously a child um, welfare campaigner, but also from the point of view of an organisation that has been hit directly by censorship. Obviously, our PayPal account was cancelled a few months ago, and although it's you know a different issue, it is related. It goes to the essence of free speech and what we allow our campaign groups and people to say online. I actually think that free speech is essential for child safety, and my worry with the bill actually is that you know from a child safety point of view. Um, does it go far enough? Can it ever go far enough when you also have this concern about free speech? And actually, do we need another approach? And, you know, the reality is that at the moment, the bill is the only thing in town. So, you know, my view is child safety um, is absolutely paramount. And it is very hard to attack the bill when there's no other reality for protecting online safety. But I do think it is time to ask whether we need an altogether tougher approach. So one thing we could 
look at is regulation of smartphones themselves. You know, we seem to be assuming that smartphones and children are okay, and therefore the what well, the um, the online safety bills it regulates the content. And I think maybe we need to step back a bit and say, well, actually, how have we got to a point where you know sixty percent of eight to eleven year olds own smartphones? Why are we allowing what is an inherently, it appears, dangerous product to be rolled out to children? But I, I take your point on that, and I do think it's disturbing just how young children are when they start picking up a phone, not least for their educational mm. development. I mean, why would you bother picking up a book if you've got um, an iPad in front of you or a smartphone? But surely, surely, the duty has to be on parents and carers, guardians of children, to decide when and if their child will start using a phone. Surely that can't be up to tech companies to regulate, or indeed the government. So I only agree with that to a point. So, you know, I am as libertarian um, as your next woman. And, you know, I would say for adults, I feel very strongly libertarian. And um, I wouldn't agree with that kind of approach for adults. However, I do think there are areas where a duty, our duty to protect children overrides otherwise libertarian principles. So I think the closest analogy here is actually cigarettes. Cigarettes, are a dangerous, addictive substance. For that reason, the state has intervened. It took a long time, actually, but the state intervened and says you can't market and sell this product to children. I don't see how smartphones in their current format are any different to that. I will readily accept that tech companies might get their act together and make these products safer for children. They might make the algorithms safer. They might regulate the content in a way that means we actually have effective age verification. But the reality is that is not happening now. What we have is a really dangerous, addictive product that is being given to children. And I think, although it is, you know, I totally get your point, Emily, that of course, parents do have a massive role here. It's really, really difficult for parents to stand against this tide when, A, so many other children have it. You know, as I said, 60% of 8 to 11-year-olds, that's up from, I think, But it was Molly, may I just interrupt you? May I just put the other point? Because, I mean... Sadly, perhaps, the genie is rather out of the bottle. Um, you know, you have so many children with their own social media profiles and so on. Would it not be better just to essentially... Would you argue that we should ban the sale of these products? to children, uh, ban parents uh, from giving their child a mobile phone. I think that would just be utterly impossible. I don't know, Emily. I think we need to have the conversation. I really do think we need to ask the question because the problem is everyone is looking at the online safety bill as if it's this panacea, this silver bullet. And I really hope it is. But the reality is it is riddled with problems. I mean, you mentioned the free speech point of view. You know, it is very difficult from a free speech point of view interview. There are also many child safety campaigners questioning whether it goes far enough. The online safety bill, and I don't know if you've read it, but it's a monster. It's yeah. 250 pages long. And as a lawyer, so I used to be a lawyer, so I've read it with that hat on. And it is problematic. It is a difficult, incredibly complex, complex piece of legislation. Generally, complex legislation is not easily enforceable. And just one example on that is, in a way, from a child safety point of view, the key provisions are around age verification. Well, they're left blank for another day. You know, there's so much about the online safety bill that isn't even yet written down because it's all to be sorted in codes of conduct. So mm -hmm. I just question whether it is going to work in the way that many are hoping. I hope it does. But I do think the time has come to ask, do we need to take a more hardline approach? Thank you very much, Molly. That's Molly Kingsley, who is the co-founder of Us For Them there. I'm particularly sceptical about this bill, actually. I think it's an absolute nightmare to read, very contradictory, and I think could have a real impact on uh, freedom of speech. Anyway, moving on to our final story of the briefing this morning, a ban on Albanian migrants claiming protection under the Modern Slavery Act could be brought in to tackle the channel migrants crisis. The Home Secretary, Suella Bravman, has said to support plans outlined in a major report by Nick Timothy to Theresa May's former aide published today. The paper, written for think tank Centre for Policy Studies, states that modern slavery laws brought in by Mrs May when she was Home Secretary are being unscrupulously abused by Albanians. Let's speak to the author himself, Nick Timothy. Thank you very much for coming on the show this morning. I know you've been Thank very you busy, that, yeah. Nick. Now, it says that Suella Braverman has welcomed this report. However, she says that she doesn't agree with all of it. Do you know which bit she doesn't agree with? 
<laughs> I don't, I'm afraid. Uh, she, uh, she, she says she doesn't agree with every proposal in it. And uh, I, think, I think we can hazard a guess that the government isn't about to introduce ID cards, which is one of our proposals. Uh, but obviously, it's, uh, it, it's a big thing for a Home Secretary to write a forward uh, in such positive terms for a report that contains policies in this way. So I think what we what we can know is that uh, is that she and the government are uh, a, a positive about the sense of direction uh, that the that the report sets out. Your report that uh, modern slavery laws are being unscrupulously abused, particularly by Albanians who are coming across the channel in record numbers. It seems the majority are now Albanian men. Now, what evidence is there that it is these laws that are being unscrupulously abused? Yeah, I think this is this is one particular part of the story. The Modern Slavery Act is you know, it's good legislation. It's important legislation. It's designed to protect people. Uh, from being trafficked and uh, from being forced into labour against their will, uh, but unfortunately, it is increasingly increasingly being used by uh, people who are illegal immigrants or people whose asylum claims are not going as they had hoped. And so, we have some proposals to tighten up the Modern Slavery Act by changing evidential thresholds, um, uh, trying to prevent people from uh, making claims in a kind of tactical way late on. Uh, and if necessary, um, uh, where there is evidence of serious widespread abuse, excluding nationalities from the provisions of the Act until order is regained. Now, Nick, I saw on your uh, Twitter feed, actually, that you highlighted research oh. by the Tory Reform Group that reveals charities fighting the Home Office Home, Home Office's plan to relocate asylum seekers to Rwanda have actually received £203 million in government support since 2017. Do we have an extraordinary situation that the government is actually funding pressure groups to lobby against their own policies? Uh, so the first thing I should say about that, it was actually published by Conservative Way Forward, but uh, there was an the error in the text of the <laughs> newspaper I was reading. Um, uh, I think, look, the government pays for certain services from some charities, uh, which are completely legitimate and fine. Uh, but, it, but it is highly questionable that so much public money is going to organisations that are then capable of putting significant resources into challenging government policy uh, and into stopping the removal of people who uh, I think quite le quite legitimately ministers conclude uh, should have no right to be here. And just very, very quickly before we have to wrap up, do we need to withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights if we're to get to grips with this issue? Well, in the report, we make recommendations for things that could change in the application of human rights law consistent with continued membership. But it is our view that ultimately we probably will have to leave the European Convention to do the things we need to do to regain control. Thank you very much, Nick, for joining us this morning. I know you're a very busy man. That was Nick Timothy, who is report author of a report that's looking into how to tackle those channel crossings for the Centre for Policy Studies. Now, that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much for tuning in to The Briefing. I'll be back tomorrow from 9.30. Coming up, it's Bev Turner today. But first, let's go to the weather. Looking ahead to today's weather, and the UK is looking to be largely cloudy, but it will feel chilly in the brisk easterly breeze. Let's take a look at the details. So areas in the far southwest of England may see the odd brighter spell, but the cloud will make it a grey day for most. Showers will also fringe southern coasts. A slight shift in the wind direction will bring the increasing risk of showers across southeast England, otherwise it's largely cloudy but feeling cold. And cloudy but a little light rain is possible for parts of Wales. This may include a small amount of sleet over the mountains. Cold and cloudy across central areas of England, but with the wind swinging around to more of a northeasterly, there is an increasing risk of a few light showers here and there later. It's eastern coasts that will see the most frequent showers today, the occasional one of which may be heavy. They'll feed inland on the brisk breeze, so it is worth holding on to an umbrella there. The showers and cloud will also push into eastern Scotland. However, northwest Scotland will likely see the brighter skies across the whole of the UK, thanks to the development of some sunny intervals. Western counties of Northern Ireland are also in with a chance of seeing some sunny spells today, but eastern coasts will be affected by isolated showers from the Irish Sea. 
So we will retain a very similar setup through Monday afternoon and evening with showers chiefly in the east. And that's how the weather is shaping up for the rest of the day. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. 